this is beneficial outside of a pandemic situation. This benefits your defendants, it benefits your court, it helps you save time. And then just, just expanding the footprint of the, uh, the clients that we have that can take advantage of the solution. From Tyler Technologies, it's the Tyler Tech Podcast, where we talk about issues facing communities today and highlight the people, places, and technology making a difference. I'm Jeff Harrell. I'm the Director of Content Marketing for Tyler, and I'm so glad that you joined me. Well, here's the problem we are addressing in today's episode. How do you provide access to justice when appearing in court is difficult? Now, besides the challenges of the pandemic, finding childcare, finding reliable transportation, or even the ability to take off work are some of the many challenges people face. Well, today we look at how technology is being used to solve this problem and create a better solution for both communities and its constituents. Well, to help us dig into how virtual court is helping solve this access to justice problem, we chat with two subject matter experts here at Tyler Technologies. Jonathan Lang is the product manager for the ENCODE Court Suite, and he is responsible for the overall direction and development of the products and services that Tyler provides to municipal courts across the country. And Marlon Jones, Marlon is the product owner for ENCODE Court Products, and in this role, she works with clients to identify and address business problems through the development of new software solutions. She's also responsible for providing support with the direction of assigned products. I think you're going to really enjoy this episode as we dig in deeper on virtual court. Here's my conversation with Jonathan and Marlon. Jonathan and Marlon, welcome to the Tyler Tech Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Excited to talk about virtual court. Jonathan, I'd love to start with you. Let us know, what is virtual court? Happy to be here today and to talk about it. Virtual court basically provides a turnkey platform for conducting face-to-face court sessions over the web. We use that with our clients that are using our ENCODE court case management system, and they use the virtual court platform to connect with defendants that are remote for any reason. And uh, interestingly, we started working on this solution back in 2019, pre-COVID. We had seen out in the industry that we saw some of our clients and some other people in the industry starting to go down this road of trying to provide a virtual court experience for people. But we noticed that they were having to cobble together a lot of different solutions in order to make that work. You know, they were using a meeting platform. They were using document platform. They were just emailing by hand to get people invited to and incorporated into the sessions. It was just a lot of manual work that we saw that people were going through. So we started thinking about how could we potentially solve this better? How could we solve this problem? Physical appearance in court is inconvenient at best. If you've ever had a ticket and had to travel downtown and try to get that taken care of, it's never convenient. Occasionally, it's just impossible because sometimes you have college students that live states away from the court and to come back to the court to take care of a traffic ticket is a big deal. Naturally, all of this was pre-COVID. So once the pandemic hit, this became a whole lot more important and a whole lot more real to our clients and something that was urgent to them. But that was really what we were after. How do we solve that problem and not just create another meeting platform? But how do we marry that with the information we have in our court systems? The case information, the balance due, the documents that are associated with the case, and how do we help them in that virtual hearing try to get that case fully resolved in one sitting so that they can talk about the case, they can they can check in for court, they can share documents back and forth, they can disposition the case, or whatever next step it needs to go to, and then actually be able to click to pay the amount due and just get it all done in one sitting instead of multiple steps. That's what we were looking to try to solve. And, um, and that's what virtual court is today. It's an ability to not only have that web conference and chat with the defendant, but also to be looking at the same sheet of paper in terms of the case information and the documents associated with it and try to really drive to a resolution so that those people don't have to physically come into court. And I was going to ask you that because I think you mentioned it was 2019 because I wondered, was this something that was a result of the pandemic 
sounds like you're working on it before that, but, but did the pandemic accelerate the technology and kind of accelerate the offering? It really did. It really, most of all, it accelerated our time frame a little bit because we worked on this all through the course of 2019. And we had been working with a focus group of clients to work through what does it need to do? What does it not need to do? What's beneficial? What could be left to the side? What could be backburnered for later, et cetera. And as we worked through the course of that, we were preparing for a release of Virtual Court in April of 2020 at our Tyler Connect conference. And as we got into March, about midway through March, that's when everything happened. Everything shut down. The conference got canceled. Everything started getting locked down. Everybody started working from home. And it was at that point in time that we looked and said, well, here's a product we were going to launch in about six weeks that seems to be tailor-made for this situation. Let's go ahead and launch it now. And so mid-March, we went ahead and launched and let everybody know, all of our clients know, that we had a solution. We offered a 90-day free trial for people to be able to jump on board and to try it out to make sure it fit what they needed to do and uh, then to be able to continue to use it. And so we saw a lot of success during that pandemic time when all that started kicking off of people being able to utilize virtual court to get over the hump and keep their courts going as uh, as everything else was shutting down and try to keep up with their work and keep cases moving along. And do you feel like the pandemic was an accelerator on the client side of accepting the solution? Because all of a sudden they they had a need, right, to be able to meet virtually. Did that accelerate the kind of the client acceptance of the of the of the solution? It definitely did. A lot less, a lot less work related to uh, it trying to explain what in the world it was, because <laughs> everybody was looking for a solution yeah. at that point in time, and a lot of solutions flying about. A lot of people trying to cobble something together. We just felt fortunate that uh, we had the right thing at the right time when the pandemic hit. And so a lot of people, it accelerated their interest. We had a lot of people reaching out to us when we announced it, saying, I'm interested in knowing more. Tell me more. Quite a few of them getting signed up and and taking it out for a spin and and moving it along and uh, using it to actually help resolve their cases as everything shut down. And from a technology standpoint, is it the cloud really is the key technology driver there? What's the technology that allows this to really happen? So a couple of key pieces of technologies or key partners that we partnered with for the technology. One, Amazon Web Services. The virtual court solution is fully hosted in, in Amazon Web Services and available there as kind of the foundation of making everything go. And then we also partnered with Twilio to solve the video conferencing and the chat problem as far as being able to, uh, instead of building a whole new thing of our own, partnering with someone who does that all day long in a, in a lot of different situations. And so a couple of key partners that we had there so that we could really focus on the user experience and we could really focus in on what does it look like? How does it feel to the users to actually use this? What problems do we need to solve beyond just the web conference and the chat? Because as you know, there's a lot of tools out there that help you do that. So providing them with a check-in process that when people are scheduled for court, that they walk through a check-in process and they acknowledge the rules and they watch a little video telling them what to expect. And they're able to upload documents that they want the judge to see, whether it's an insurance card or a copy of their driver's license or a receipt saying they got something taken care of. Being able to really address the user experience around it as opposed to the technical challenges uh, was essential. Being able to link that in with our court case management system. So when somebody gets scheduled for a session in our court system, it automatically sends them that invitation. They don't have to go to another step to send them an invitation and make sure they show up. It automatically does that for them. And then recording that back to the court case management system that they attended, that they checked in, that something was discussed and changed. It records all that back to the case history. And any of the documents that are uploaded are downloaded into the court case management system and into our document management system. So everything ends up in one spot at the end. And Marlon, I'd love to to ask you, I know you work with with clients of all sizes. Uh, The virtual court solution, how how have you seen it help some of our smaller communities? Absolutely. Yeah. Before I answer that question, I'll mention that one of the biggest things that we've we've 
really accomplished as well is Virtual Court is a very tight knit community. So we work really hands on, really closely with a lot of our courts from what we released back in March to where we are today has really been a user based design. The, the clients have had significant feedback. And a lot of the responses that we received from like just some of the smaller courts that I've heard from in this instance that I'm just going to really read just the exact quote that I received from a customer. It just tells their story and I couldn't, couldn't have told it better myself. He said, virtual court has opened a world of options that didn't exist before. In the past, we had, we were rigidly stuck with in-person appearances. These packed the courtroom. They also created hardships for defendants which hits certain defendants harder than others. And this is, is especially true for defendants in lower socioeconomic situations. So in an example, a defendant that lives hours away needed to resolve a suspended license, in an example. And they didn't have the money to come back to the court. They probably didn't have a dependable car to make it all of that way. And they probably didn't have a job that they could really take that extra time off to be gone for you know a half a day or a day in that instance. With virtual court, those folks only had to really step away while on break at their job. Mm. So, you know, these are they're not even having to leave their job and go somewhere. We've seen people sitting in the break room conducting, you know, attending yeah. virtual court. For so for smaller courts where it's not easy for them to get to that access, virtual court has brought that access to those defendants. I, th I think it's easy to go, well, it's it's great because of the pandemic where we can't get together mm -hmm. physically. But as you just pointed out, it's actually great for people who can't get to the court for some reason, don't have the transportation, the child care, they've got a job they need to be at. So yes. it really gives access to people beyond what we might think of the pandemic causing. Absolutely, Jeff. You know, when we started this, like Jonathan mentioned early on, when we started writing our use cases, pandemic was not on the list of things. I yeah. remember looking and doing some initial research and, and saw a couple of things about, you know, pandemics. And I thought, eh, who needs that? So I just <laughs> totally disregarded that part. And little did we know that that would be at the top of our list for a use case. So it's kind of, uh, I, I laugh now, but uh, who, who knew? Who knew? <laughs> I remember in college, so I'm going through a town and I was probably speeding and get pulled over for a ticket, but I don't really probably think about the ticket or want to address it. Does it help with those sorts of situations? Because I can imagine a small community like that, those things start to build up, clog up the court system, yes. does it help alleviate that sort of thing? Absolutely. We've got courts along the way, like uh, New Braunfels, Texas, you know, different places along that way that have a lot of college students that are transient back and forth. And that's exactly what we thought virtual court would be used for. We've also have it, I think one of the biggest things that we, what some of our developers quickly developed after the pandemic was adding separate, what we call locations and rooms. And that meant that meeting with the prosecutors, meeting with, you know, defense attorneys or anything along that line, you had the opportunity to have separate rooms and locations. So that took into consideration some of the juveniles or maybe a parent wants to come along with a college student or anything like that. And they may be in two different locations. So we set it up to where both of those parties can come together. And if they want to talk to just the prosecutor solely by themselves, they have the liberty to do so as opposed to just coming in and immediately meeting with the judge. So definitely we've taken that into perspective. Well, what about some of our larger communities that we work with? How does virtual court benefit them? What's happened there is that we've got a couple of, uh, I'll speak specifically about a, a judge that we have in Texas and he is adamant. And when you hear him speak, he's adamant about taking justice to the constituents. And a lot of times in the larger cities, it's hard. It's hard for them to get the bus ride to the courthouse or anything like that. So there's opportunities where they can take virtual court into the community, set up in a grocery store, set up in a library, set up in different places in the community that is just not taking the folks where the people in the larger cities have to come into downtown or anything like that, where the, the, the courtrooms and that sort of stuff are, are set up. Communities, big or small all on the table. Do you have any favorite stories that you've heard when as you've worked with clients across the country that you'd love to share with us? I will I will say 
My favorite story is sort of a warning. Like I said, it's a very tight knit community and we work really hands on with a lot of our courts. So there's a lot of times that we spend time observing. So we'll cop into the room and um, we'll watch the court sessions. And I know I was in with a court administrator and virtual court sometimes just allows defendants to forget that it's still really court. And we were ready to bring in a defendant and they were in the bathroom. So (laughs) warn your constituents, we say that it's still live virtual court and it should still be considered professional. Do as you would if you walked into the brick and mortar. Don't forget that. So that's one thing that I would say is uh, it's it's allowed, you know, I know a lot of the courts have said now that they've gone back to some live sessions as well, that a lot of their defendants are calling in saying, Kent, I don't want to come to court. I want to do this in virtual court. So that's the positive thing too, is that it's taken a lot of that foot traffic out whether it's big or small, you know, it's giving that that court staff that time that they need to really focus on their day to day and not having to do so many inter- interactions at that front desk or at that front window. They're able to conduct a lot of that business virtually. I love that warning. I think we, we probably all should remember that too. When we get on virtual meetings, you've heard stories about people who were in the bathroom or didn't have pants on or all that sort of thing. So I love that warning. <laughs> Any other fun examples or or stories that you have as you've worked with, like you said, these close-knit clients with virtual court? Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. I'll say another positive thing that a lot of the courts have said is that it has really changed their failures to appear. And that is huge because a lot of times, like like both of us, like Jonathan and I mentioned earlier, is that the people just don't have the time to take away And a lot of courts were experiencing people just not showing up to court because it's virtual and they don't have to take away a lot of time. And one of the instances is a court out of Wisconsin. And they said that, you know, a lot of their folks are spending about 15 minutes with the judge and then they get to go on with their day. So that means people aren't afraid that they're going to have to go spend three or four hours sitting in a courtroom all day. So virtual court is a positive influence because 10, 15 minutes of your time and you're done. You've been able to talk to the judge, talk to a prosecutor and make a payment if you want to that same day. So that makes a big difference for those folks there. So it sounds like, Marlon, there's a lot of benefits on the constituent side, you know, not having to find childcare, not having to leave a job, not having to find transportation. Yeah, they're they're able to appear, they're able to attend their court session. School teachers don't have to get a substitute they can just ask someone to watch their class while they're on the playground. I've seen teachers on the playground just, you know, conducting court for a quick second and then going back to the students running around on the playground. So it it definitely has changed the way that the constituents have access to justice. And it's more in line with the time that's permissible to their life and their schedules. It meets them where they're at with their life. I love that. And then on the on the client side, there's tons of benefits as well. So they're able to get cases through the system. They're not backlogged, things like that. What are some of the ones that maybe I, I'm not even aware of? Oh, yeah. We've got courts that are, that had, you know, when the pandemic first started, they had like eight, 900 cases in their backlog, and they were so afraid that they weren't going to be able to work through those. But once they joined virtual court, they were able to continue business and not have to shut down. Even though they shut down the courts and nobody was going in, virtual court allowed them to just conveniently log in from their home and the judge, prosecutor, clerks, anyone that was participating in that session were able to continue business separately and, and not have to completely stop everything and then come back to 2000 cases when I think a lot of courts started opening up June, July timeframe of, uh, I think it was, I don't remember. I'm so confused on the dates. These days, so <laughs> we all <that>. are. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like great benefits for constituents, yeah. great benefits for our clients. So really in total, the community, the community wins. Jonathan, yeah. I'd love to turn it back to you and, and have you talk a little bit about the future of virtual court, where, where it's headed, you know, anything new that that's on the horizon. So one of the things that I think is important to say is that even though we released this in the March of 2020, 
we didn't just release something and it's and it just stayed the way it was we had been working with our clients all through that process and developing it kind of refining it then after we released it we continued to add and change and refine based on feedback and real life data in terms of what was going to be beneficial for those courts and what they needed and so it's continued to grow uh, right now we're making kind of the transition between coming out of the pandemic, can we be hopeful and say that? Coming yeah, out of the pandemic, kind of shifting from crisis, which a lot of those courts find themselves in, shifting from crisis back to convenience. Back in 2019, when this whole idea started, it was about convenience. It was about getting more people to show up for court, to get more people to actually appear and not skip their court appearance, to make it more convenient for people. So we're starting to shift that that discussion back from crisis to convenience and really kind of making that point. Currently, virtual court is available for our clients that are using our municipal court product, Encode Court. That's what we have it integrated with. That's what it pulls information back and forth with on there. But coming in 2022, we will also have it available for state and county courts that are using our Odyssey court case management system. So more complicated criminal cases, some civil situations, civil case situations will also be able to be handled through virtual court as well. So we're excited to see that user base expand into new case types and new experiences that can make it even more convenient for those courts as well, those those larger courts as well. We're continuing to build onto it. We've got some other features that we're excited about adding into the virt- virtual court platform. And so as we go through the course of 2022, we'll have new things that are added in there. Uh, but that's really kind of where we stand today as far as trying to make that shift back to saying, look, this is beneficial outside of a pandemic situation. This benefits your defendants. It benefits your court. It helps you save time. And then just just expanding the footprint of the uh, the clients that we have that can take advantage of the solution. And we probably have clients listening that have virtual court. Will, will they finally get to hear about the big announcements at Connect 2022 that we were, they were going to hear about two years ago? Maybe we should relaunch it. Maybe we should go into 2022 and say, let's, we didn't get to make a big deal about this in 2020. Let's, uh, let's do it now. Let's have our party. Exactly. So. I love that. Well, if someone is interested in hearing more about virtual court, what's the best thing for them to do? What's the good next step for them? Sure thing. One thing they can always do is if you're a current ENCODE client, reach out to your friendly neighborhood inside sales rep or email inside sales at tylertech.com. They can definitely get you more information about virtual court and all the also the other case resolution tool solutions that we have that link together with virtual court to really make that a seamless experience. Uh, if we have people listening to the podcast, I hope we do, that are not currently part of the ENCODE Court family, please reach out to us. Visit tylertech.com. Uh, you can find extra information about Virtual Court out there. You can see a video of a short demo uh, in terms of what it looks like, how it feels to be in Virtual Court, and it'll provide ways for you to get in touch with us to show your interest from that perspective as well. Well, Jonathan, Marlon, thanks so much for this. This is awesome. I feel like I know a lot more about Virtual Court, so thanks for your time and your expertise. Absolutely. You're welcome. Join our community. It's fun. Well, thanks, Jonathan and Marlon, for helping us better understand how technology through our virtual court solution is providing access to justice and helping both communities and its constituents. And thank you for joining today's episode. You know, we drop a new episode every other Monday, so please subscribe. We have a lot of great things planned as we finish off 2021 and move into 2022. So again, please subscribe. And if you enjoy the podcast, leave us a written review. That would be awesome. Well, until next time, this is Jeff Harrell, Director of Content Marketing for Tyler Technologies. We'll talk to you soon.